When you save on auto insurance for driving safe with USAA SafePilot, you'll feel like a big deal. Even in a traffic jam. Save up to 30% with USAA SafePilot. Restrictions apply. Before we begin, a quick note. This episode contains descriptions of violence and injuries that might be disturbing to some listeners. Hi, Coco. This is Josh. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you for finding me. (laughs) We found Coco Kondo at her home outside of Kobe, Japan, huddled in front of a Zoom screen. Whenever she turned her camera on, the internet went out. So I got only a brief glimpse of where she lives, in a house that's attached to a church. For Coco, this place is a throwback to how she grew up. My father is a Methodist minister in the church in Hiroshima. As a little girl, she was always tagging along with her father and desperate to get his attention. There were constantly parishioners coming in and out to see him. I couldn't understand why he was so... One day in the early 1950s, a group of young women showed up who Coco had never seen before. Many high school, junior high or senior high school students came to church one by one. They met in the church's basement and sat together in folding chairs. They sang hymns and talked for hours, and they treated Coco like one of their own. They were so sweet. They called me Coco-chan. Koko-chan, they treated me like their little sister. Week after week, they kept coming back to sing and to talk and to spend time with Coco. One day, one of the women started combing Coco's hair. When Coco turned her head to look, she saw the woman's hand. I was so shocked. All the fingers were stick together, melted together. I wish I could ask her, what's happened to your hand? Coco was too polite to ask that question. So she sat and listened. And gradually, she learned what these meetings were about. That something had happened on August 6, 1945, when Coco was just eight months old. All of the women had a story to tell about that day. One of them was named Shigeko Niyamoto. The morning was a beautiful sky, and I was a student. I was 13 years old. Shigeko was walking outside on her way to school. During World War II, she'd gotten used to hearing air raid sirens. But now, everything was quiet. And then she looked up and saw an airplane. Almost the same time, I felt a very strong wind or explosion and knocked me down. I don't know how long it passed by, but when I look around, everybody different and just different world, just like a hell. Shigeko somehow managed to scramble to a nearby schoolyard, but then lost consciousness. When she woke up, the world was learning what had been done to Japan. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. No one knows exactly how many people died in the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The estimates range from 70,000 to 140,000 of the roughly 250,000 who were in the city that day. And uh, the miracle I lived because many people thought I'm going to die. It took months for Shigeko to be able to sit up. When she finally gained enough strength, she crawled out of bed and grabbed a mirror. When I first time I saw myself, I, I couldn't believe that was me. Red skin and pointy nose and the big eyes. And I just uh, like a monster I was seeing. Sitting in her father's church years later, Coco Kondo was shocked by the story she was hearing. I listened to their conversation very, very carefully. For her, all of this was a revelation. Coco was a survivor, too. But in 1945, she'd been only a baby. Now she understood that an American plane called the Enola Gay had dropped a devastating bomb, unleashing misery on Hiroshima. Then I realized 
That's why many girls were disfigured. When she looked at the women in her father's church, she realized that they all carried visible reminders of the bombing. One of them was missing her right eyelid. Another had lost the ability to smile because of scar tissue that wrenched her lips. Coco was furious. If they never, ever dropped a bomb, those girls didn't have to suffer. So little Coco thought, when I grown up, I am definitely going to find the people who were on the airplane. I wanted to revenge them. I wanted to bite them or kick them or punch them. The young women who met in that church basement didn't talk about revenge. They spoke about their shared pain and what they could do to ease it. For a long time, it seemed like nothing was ever going to get better. But then, in 1955, they found a reason to hope. 25 Japanese girls arrived by special invitation of various American groups. They're in the U.S. for free plastic surgery to correct disfiguring scars caused by that explosion 10 years ago. Millions of Americans would marvel at the 25 women who landed on their shores, all survivors of the atomic bombing. The press would call them the Hiroshima Maidens. For the United States, their arrival was an opportunity for self-reflection, to see the damage the bomb had caused, if the country was willing to look. These Japanese survivors would go to the White House and end up on a bizarre proto-reality TV show. They'd also put their lives in the hands of American doctors, hoping that risky cutting-edge surgeries might repair their injuries and give them a chance for a fresh start. She had almost 20 previous operations in Japan. She had no healthy skin left. There was a lot of concern about anything that might go wrong, that might backfire. Many people ask me, why you go to the America? America dropped the bomb. This is the season finale of One Year, 1955. The Hiroshima Maiden. This episode is brought to you by Pete's. Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Before the bombing. Hiroshima was a vibrant city, a military and transportation hub with a bustling downtown shopping district. And then, in a flash of light, all of that was gone. There was nothing left but ruins. All institutions and organizations, public and private, were destroyed. As Hiroshima struggled to recover, a Methodist church became a refuge for survivors. The minister was Koko Kondo's father, Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto. He put all his energy to his church and the people in Hiroshima. After the bombing, Reverend Tanimoto had dedicated his life to getting the city and its people back to full health. Not only a church member, it doesn't matter, it's everybody who survived. Reverend Tanimoto had been unhurt in the attack and felt an enormous sense of duty towards those who had been injured. He started his relief work close to home, distributing food and water, clothes and medicine. Then, a year after the bombing, the writer John Hersey featured Tanimoto in his New Yorker essay, Hiroshima, making the minister internationally famous. Reverend Tanimoto traveled to the United States, speaking out against nuclear war and raising money for widows and orphans. He had so many visions for what he wanted to do for Hiroshima. That included creating support groups for survivors, like Shigeko Niyamoto. I liked him. I really liked Mr. Tanimoto, and uh, he's kind, nice. Shigeko was the 13-year-old who barely survived the bombing and whose injuries left her unrecognizable, even to herself. She had burns all over her body and thick masses of scar tissue on her face and hands, 
that left her struggling to move her neck or hold a pencil. By the time she found Reverend Tanamoto's church, she was 19, and she'd spent years feeling desperately alone. I don't have any opportunity to commune with other people. I just stay home, and, and I couldn't go back to school. Reverend Tanamoto had introduced her to other survivors, but she wanted to make deeper connections. So she suggested that they start a group exclusively for young women. So every afternoon, we went to the church. Then more girls get together, more girls get together. In this room, with this group of people, Shigeko finally felt understood. All of these women knew what it felt like to get judged or ridiculed for how they looked to get rejected by employers because they were seen as too feeble, to walk into a store and have the other customers scatter because they didn't want to get too close. I mean, they were wearing the symbol of the atomic bomb on their face. Author Rodney Barker spoke with several women from the church group for a book he wrote about their experiences. Some of the audio you've been hearing is from his interviews. And so people stared at them, and people weren't sure that exposure to radiation might not be contagious in some way. According to Shigeko, these young women were seen as damaged goods. Here, young girls like me, many young men afraid to marry us. No one thought that they would be eligible to be married, not only because of the disfigurement, but because of the questions around radiation exposure and what that would mean to any children they might bear. Talking about their suffering together in a support group helped the women feel less alone. But they would have to get outside help to solve the problems they faced in post-war Japan. What the women needed was reconstructive surgery, operations that would free them of scar tissue, allowing them to use their hands more freely and loosen their constricted joints. But after the war, getting that kind of treatment was close to impossible. The Japanese government essentially did nothing to help, leaving disabled and often penniless survivors unable to get the care they needed. As for the U.S. government, they brought doctors to look at the Hiroshima survivors. But those doctors were focused on studying victims of the atomic bomb, not helping them. And the victims themselves felt like guinea pigs. First, you use this weapon that people don't know what the effects are. Now you're coming in and you're studying us, and you're not doing anything to treat us or ameliorate the conditions. Reverend Tanamoto asked those government doctors to give medical treatment to the survivors in his church, but they refused. And so he helped raise money for nine of the women, including Shigeko, to see private surgeons in Japan. And the nine girls first, we had an operation in Tokyo the biggest hospital. The operations were not a big success. When the surgeons cut away their scar tissue, it tended to grow right back. And for Shigeko, the procedures did further damage. That was a butcher. Took all my skin. See, I didn't have a no scar on my half body, but now it's all over like a world map. Those Japanese doctors weren't necessarily incompetent. The women's injuries were unprecedented and plastic surgery wasn't yet an established field in Japan. But Reverend Tanimoto wasn't ready to give up. In the early 1950s, he reached out to anyone he thought might help, including an American named Norman Cousins. I don't believe that any ideology anywhere in the world can stand against the notion that this world should be made safe for all the humans who live in it. Norman Cousins was the uh, liberal editor of the Saturday Review of Literature magazine. It was a very popular magazine at the time. He was also a, a left-leaning peace activist. A banner must be raised. People have to believe that this is important. When Cousins and his wife came to Japan in 1953, Reverend Tanimoto set up a meeting in the basement of his church. Shigeko was in that room. Just the operation finished about a couple months later, Mr. Cousin and Mrs. Cousin came over Hiroshima. So Mr. Tanimot brought those girls again to the church to meet them. One by one, the women stepped forward. With Reverend Tanimoto translating, they explained how they'd been injured and what they'd gone through in the year since the bombing. Norman Cousins was deeply moved by their stories. Afterward, he and Reverend Tanimoto came up with a plan they were going to send the women to the world's best plastic surgeons. And those surgeons were in the United States. Both men hoped to get the survivors top-notch medical care, 
But they also had an ulterior motive. These young women were the ultimate innocent victims. If Americans could see and meet them, they could become potent symbols for the global peace movement and help rid the world of nuclear weapons. And that was exactly what the U.S. government didn't want to happen. The State Department uh, was very nervous, as you can imagine. And we were going into the Cold War with the Soviet Union. America's national defense was building up nuclear weapons. The Nevada desert in America is the scene of the latest atomic test. Another awesome addition to America's atomic arsenal. So anything that could disrupt American support of a defense policy depending on nuclear weapons was something that made them very nervous. These women from Japan, with their burns and scars, seemed like a direct threat to that pro-nuclear policy. For the longest time, most Americans never even saw photos of the victims from Hiroshima or Nagasaki, the site of the second nuclear attack. That was because the government banned the media from running those images while they allowed publications to say as much as they wanted about Japanese war crimes. State Department officials were also told not to call the Hiroshima survivors victims of the nuclear bomb. Instead, they referred to them as victims of misfortune. So, Reverend Tanimoto and Norman Cousins would get no help from the U.S. government. It was up to Cousins, the American, to figure out the logistics of sending the women to the United States for surgery, and how to pay for it all. The guy had no money. I mean, his attitude towards this whole thing was, we will ask for the volunteerism of Americans and money will show up. For six months, Cousins asked American companies and foundations for support. All of them turned him down, saying the whole thing was just too politically fraught. But then, out of nowhere, he had a breakthrough. Cousins struck a deal with the head of plastic surgery at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. Their doctors agreed to perform operations on 20 or so women, with all the expenses paid by the chairman of the hospital's board. In April of 1955, surgeons from Mount Sinai flew to Japan to evaluate potential patients, including Shigeko. No one knows who's going. Each one had an examination for the physical first. And then second, they had an interview each girl. The doctors asked Shigeko how she'd feel about leaving home. Would you like to go to America? If you select, you want to go. I said, I don't think they will select. After the extensive operations she'd already had in Japan, Shigeko thought she was a lost cause. But these Americans disagreed. The doctors chose her and 24 other survivors from Reverend Tanimoto's church and elsewhere. Most of the women were in their late teens and early 20s. None of them had ever left Japan. Now, they all needed to make a decision. Would they trust American surgeons to reverse the damage that an American weapon had caused? In the spring of 1955, they made their choice. On the morning of May 5th, all 25 women gathered together, wearing matching blue suits paid for by a local charity. They were joined by Reverend Tanimoto, three Japanese doctors, and a group of translators. The travelers loaded into a cargo plane that a friendly American general had loaned to the cause. Ten-year-old Coco was there to say goodbye. It was so scared. But after I grown up, one of the girls said to me, Coco, Coco-chan, I just wanted to put my face back to when I born to this world. That's the only hope I had. We'll be back in a minute. For Shigeko Niyamoto, Everything that happened in 1955 was a new experience. That included the first flight of her life on a military airplane. The soldiers was on a plane, and of course we don't know the, the language, just smiling at each other. The trip to America was not luxurious. Shigeko and the 24 other women were riding in an aircraft known as Old Shaky. 
But the soldiers on board did their best to make them feel comfortable. They passed around moist towels and served refreshments that Shigeko had never tasted. And the Coca-Cola, first time I drank, I felt like I'm drinking the medicine. Wow, this is what is this? She didn't feel scared or nervous, just excited. Even when they hit turbulence and water flew out of the airplane's latrine, everyone on board was having a great time. Just feeling it was uh, good. It's all about like a school kids trip. Their journey to the East Coast would take four days, including a layover in Hawaii to pay their respects at a Pearl Harbor memorial. As their plane passed over San Francisco, the women caught their first glimpse of the mainland. From the sky, they saw a landscape with no burned out homes or buildings. Trees are different and suddenly different atmospheres. On the morning of May 9th, they landed in New York. And when they stepped off the plane, they were swarmed by reporters. 25 girls from Hiroshima arrived in New York City via U.S. Army transport. The American press had been hyping up their arrival for more than a month, and pretty much everyone referred to the women by the same nickname, the Hiroshima Maidens. When the girls were met by a battery of photographers at the airport, they appeared shy and retiring, almost suspicious. The coverage focused on how the women looked, One writer said that they will find out in the coming months of plastic surgery whether their faces will ever be pleasant to look at again. Newspapers and newsreels also emphasized the generosity of Americans chipping in to help. Memories of Pearl Harbor with which the Japanese brought on the Pacific War are put aside as the American people extend a warm welcome and a helping hand to these innocent victims of war's horror. I'm very happy to be in America. Thank you very much. The women would have their operations at New York City's Mount Sinai Hospital, but Mount Sinai couldn't accommodate them all at once. While they waited their turns, they'd live in the homes of American families. And Norman Cousins, the magazine editor who'd organized the trip, thought one group in particular would make ideal hosts. Arrangements had been made for them to live with Quaker families in the vicinity of New York City during the intervals between their operations. Historically, Quakers have been involved in rehabilitation projects. Quakers are known for pacifism as well. That's author Rodney Barker again. He was raised in a Quaker household. My family were kind of social activists, if you will. And then it was natural for us to volunteer our home. He was nine years old when two of the Hiroshima maidens came to live with them. Misako Kanabi was one of the women, and Suzui Oshima was the other one. The Barker family lived 40 miles outside of New York City in the suburban enclave of Darien, Connecticut. Some people in Darien weren't as open as the Barkers. But in a town well-known for excluding Black and Jewish people, the neighbors were mostly intrigued by these young survivors from Japan. More curiosity than anything, the kids in the neighborhood as well, too. These were injured girls in the war who were coming here. They were curious. They would ask questions about that. Yeah, nine or ten years old, I can't explain nuclear policy. The women themselves faced a very challenging transition. They didn't speak much English. And after scraping by and bombed out Hiroshima, life in the opulent American suburbs was jarring. Our way of living is so different from yours. If these girls were girls from Tokyo, maybe, they would have been more used to the Western way of living. Helen Yokoyama was a Japanese-American who had lived and worked in Hiroshima. In 1955, she was the women's translator and confidant. Shortly after arrival in New York, we discussed what we should do and how we could adjust. The women wouldn't have the luxury of acclimating to America in private. They would be under the glare of a media fascinated by the Hiroshima maidens. Journalists would come to the house. New York papers and local papers. The Associated Press reporter came to the house, and they would interview the women. Suzue Oshima told the AP that she'd gotten used to the burns that covered her arms and legs and the scar tissue that twisted her face. She said, I'm not expecting miracles, but I know I'll be helped some. The project's American director, Norman Cousins, talked to reporters, too. Sometimes, he used the media to speak for the women, claiming that they hoped to end all wars. He also courted publicity to try to raise money. 
And that would lead to one of the most uncomfortable moments in television history. Two days after they arrived in the U.S., Cousins put Reverend Kiyoshi Tanamoto in front of a massive national audience. I will never forget May 11, 1955. Coco, Reverend Tanamoto's 10-year-old daughter, was in Los Angeles, standing backstage at one of America's most popular TV shows. It was a big, big hall. Many audience were sitting. Coco and her family had been flown in from Japan by the show's producers. They were told they had to keep that a secret from Coco's father. And that was just one of a whole bunch of surprises. Because that night in Los Angeles, Reverend Tanimoto had no idea what he was in for. Reverend Tanimoto, yes. uh, when did you arrive in this country? Well, let me see. I uh, <laughs> Two days ago. Two days yes. ago. Now, you thought, of course, you were going to be interviewed. But uh, we've been working, uh, and you didn't know this, you see. We may have a little surprise. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> this is your life, Kiyoshi Tanimoto. Each week on This Is Your Life, host Ralph Edwards presented someone's life story to millions of viewers. As the cameras rolled, Figures from that person's past would emerge out of nowhere. I want you to look at our archway here, Reverend Tani Moto, because coming through it is Miss Bertha Starkey of Warrensville, Ohio. Here's Miss Starkey. Oh, Miss Starkey, I know her too. Coco was delighted to see her father's Methodist mentor and his old classmate. Dr. Marvin Green, and here... Oh, Dr. Green. I was so happy because I'd met him before. But then there was a third guest who Coco didn't recognize. Now, you've never met him, have never seen him, but he's here tonight to clasp your hand in friendship. Captain Robert Lewis, United States Air Force, who along with Paul Tibbetts piloted the plane from which the first atomic power was dropped over Hiroshima. This Is Your Life loved a big surprise. But this time, they'd outdone themselves. I so shocked. Ever since she'd learned about the bombing, Coco had vowed to find the people responsible and make them pay. And now, the co-pilot of the Enola Gay was right in front of her. I always, always wanted to be bench. If you never dropped that bomb, this never happened. But as Coco stood off stage, all she could do was watch Captain Lewis stroll forward and shake hands with her father for a few painfully long seconds. Reverend Tanimoto seems both befuddled by what's happening and resigned to his inability to stop it. Captain Lewis, come in here close, and would you tell us, sir, of your experience on August 6, 1945? Ralph Edward asked the Captain Lewis, how did you feel after you dropped the ball? As I said before, Mr. Edwards, I wrote down later, my God, what have we done? Well, he said, my God, what have we done? Tears came out from his eye. In that moment, Coco changed her mind about wanting revenge. So I looked inside of myself. My goodness, the same human being. The tears came out. Coco's father hadn't gone on TV to redeem Captain Lewis. His mission was to get justice for atomic bomb survivors. And despite the strangeness and cruelty of that on-air surprise, television could still help him accomplish his goal. Uh, what is that work, sir, that you are doing right now at the present moment? Well, I brought a group of girls uh, who have a terrible disfigurement on the event of uh, atomic uh, explosion on Hiroshima. And uh, we are hoping to have a plastic surgery for them. Two of the women came with Reverend Tanimoto to appear on the show, though they weren't exactly on camera. To avoid causing them any embarrassment, we'll not show you their faces. May I present Mr. Koya Minowa and Ms. Todaka Emori. The women were in silhouette, hidden behind a screen, and they spoke in Japanese. <laughs> They said they're happy to be in America yes. and thank the United States for what they're doing now for them. Just before the program ended, 
the announcer asked everyone at home to donate to the cause. Well, friends, I know that you're greatly moved by hearing about the efforts being made for these young women, and I'm sure that many of you will be eager to help them regain the beauty that might have been lost. I'm sure they will, Bob. And if you'll accept a change of mood now, I'd like to tell you a bit about wonderful extra rich liquid prell shampoo. That's the thrilling news. Time magazine raved about the episode, calling it dramatic, affecting, and powerful. Officials from the U.S. State Department thought it was a catastrophe. They feared that the Hiroshima maidens were being used to stir up propaganda, that viewers at home, disturbed and moved by what they'd seen, would rally to ban the atomic bomb. The audience did respond by opening their checkbooks. Mr. Tanimoto's appearance resulted in 22,000 viewers sending in a total of $52,422 for the fund. That windfall was the equivalent of $600,000 today, enough to hire a full-time American nurse and bring over a group of Japanese doctors to observe the women's surgeries. Just a few weeks after This Is Your Life aired on television, the operations would start. The 25 young women from Hiroshima at last began the course of restorative surgery. Filled with the last hope that the skill and advanced technological development of New York's Mount Sinai Hospital and a team of top U.S. surgeons could literally save their lives and prepare them to face the world once again. After years of waiting, the women were about to find out if their trip to America would be a salvation or a terrible mistake. Let's take a quick break. Manhattan's Mount Sinai Hospital is on Fifth Avenue, across from Central Park. Starting in late May of 1955, the women from Hiroshima were brought there two at a time to get worked on by a team of plastic surgeons. So a great many of the injuries were hand and the face. That's one of the Mount Sinai doctors, Arthur Barsky. They have heavy, thick scars that make the surgery immeasurably more difficult. The women were facing highly invasive surgeries. To repair severe facial scarring, for instance, a patient might have a chunk of flesh transplanted from her abdomen. What happens is when the skin is burned, third degree is complete destruction of the skin. That means that the skin has to be replaced. In some cases, we had to resect the joints, take off part of the bone, make it possible for the patient to flex. These were state-of-the-art techniques in 1955, but the surgeons had been given just one year to operate on all 25 women. That was an aggressive timeline, given how complicated these cases were. They'd have an average of five operations, with each requiring general anesthesia. Those surgeries would be spread out over time, so they wouldn't know the final outcome until well into the following year. As a family, we continued to visit them in the hospital. The two women Rodney Barker's family hosted in Connecticut, Masako Kanabe and Suzue Oshima, were in and out of the hospital in 1955 and 1956. We would be the, the friends that would call on them after the surgery when they were still bandaged up and things like that. When the women had recovered enough to leave Mount Sinai, they returned to their Quaker host families. Barker remembers Masako and Suzue wanting to go swimming, but being embarrassed because of their scars. And so um, one of the activities we did from time to time was go out to a beach under cover of night, if you will, and uh, tell them they put on their bathing suits and they could go swimming and they could enjoy the water, all of us as a family. The more time the women spent in the U.S., the more they seemed to get acclimated to American culture. When we first arrived, they were continually writing their parents, which I know that was a sign of homesickness. But gradually, their letters uh, came to be two and three weeks apart. This country is such a big country, and uh, it's very interesting. That's Shigeko Niyamoto in 1956. In between operations, the women got a whirlwind tour of American sites, including trips to the White House and the Metropolitan Opera. Did you go to um, any of the baseball games? I understand that. Oh, yes. <laughs> I like baseball game very much. I like 
Dodger C. Well, you're a Brooklyn Dodger <laughs> yes. fan, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I'm a Japanese girl, but um, Japanese team and Dodgers game. If Dodgers won, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the women also got involved in their local communities, taking language classes, making art, and forming lasting friendships with their Quaker hosts. But their experiences in the suburbs weren't uniformly wonderful. The acceptance and interest on the part of the Quaker community was varied. Some of the families uh, had lost people in the war, still held a resentment to Japanese. And there was one woman, um, and it turned out she was asking them to clean house, do the dishes, and she had lost somebody in the war. You know, this is her, her way of getting through the Japanese to pay back, was to have these women and her home being servants. They were moved out of that house as soon as the women said something about that. The women weren't staying with American families to work or to foster cultural exchange. It was to bide time after surgery and to see if each operation worked. From Rodney Barker's nine-year-old perspective, there were clear signs of progress as the months went on. I could see the stages of improvement. And there weren't these angry red keloid scars on their faces. And additionally, they were given lessons on makeup. There were these transplants, these grafts, and then they put the makeup over it, and it was like a miracle before your eyes. Some of the most dramatic results had nothing to do with appearances. One woman, Hiroko Tasaka, told her story in a radio documentary. Before I had an operation in Japan, then um, my neck is, cannot move, but now I can move my neck, so I'm so glad. Hiroko could move freely again after 13 operations at Mount Sinai, more than anyone else. In that same documentary, Helen Yokoyama spoke about another success story, a woman who regained the use of her arm. And as she uh, talked to her mother over the telephone, she completely forgot that it was a telephone. And before you knew, she began, uh, you know, bending her arm back and forth and said, uh, see, mother, see what I can do. I can even comb my hair now. It was such a dramatic uh, moment that all who were listening and just could not help keep the tears back. Not everyone would have the same results. Six months in, it was clear that Shigeko Niyamoto's injuries weren't going to magically disappear, even with American surgical techniques. They did a, a yeah, skin graft to open my neck, little bit by little bit, and then hand it to. I couldn't move my fingers. They tried to strain out, but they couldn't. For Shigeko, this was a disappointment, but not a surprise. All of the women understood that there were limits to what the doctors could do. But none of them were prepared for the Hiroshima Maidens Project to take a tragic turn. On May 24, 1956, Tomoko Nakabayashi would undergo her third operation at Mount Sinai Hospital. Tomoko's arms and hand had been badly damaged in the bombing of Hiroshima. But thanks to the American surgeons, her outlook had improved dramatically. This was going to be her last operation. But not long after she went under, Tomoko became unresponsive. We had a catastrophe. Tomoko Nakabayashi had a cardiac arrest. That's one of the doctors from Mount Sinai, William Hitzig. We struggled for six hours to revive her, but her brain never was restored, and she died. Tomoko's death was a shock to everyone, and a big story in newspapers across the country. When the news reached Japan, there were all kinds of questions about who was at fault and what had gone wrong. An autopsy showed that her cardiac arrest had nothing to do with the effects of atomic radiation. The cause of death was complications from anesthesia. When Tomoko died, we had great fears that this might cause a terrific depression on the remaining group. With the risks of surgery now so stark, it seemed like the whole project was in danger of getting canceled. But the truth was, the remaining survivors didn't have any better options. If they wanted to repair their hands and limbs and necks and faces, these American doctors were their only hope. So they chose to keep on going. 
For more than a year, the U.S. had watched these young girls with admiration. Now, through the success of the Mount Sinai surgeons, the story became one of medical, political, and moral triumph. The surgeries were finished in October 1956. There were no more medical calamities after Tomoko Nakabayashi's death. And as everything wrapped up, the American press celebrated the Hiroshima Maidens Project as an enormous victory. You know, the emphasis was on American know-how. The technological advances that allowed them to develop a bomb also allowed them to perfect certain techniques that could correct the injuries from the bomb. Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto and Norman Cousins had hoped the women would come to represent the intolerable price of nuclear war. Instead, in the United States at least, the Hiroshima Maidens became symbols of America's fundamental goodness. The U.S. technology and generosity had saved them from a lifetime of pain, no matter who'd inflicted that pain in the first place. And now, after a year and a half and a total of 140 operations, it was time for them to go back home. Would you like to say something, Hiroko? Yes. I am Hiroko Tasaka. Thank you very much, everybody. Now, uh, I have... Now I have uh, many wonderful, I know many wonderful people and many wonderful things to remember. Shortly before their return, three of the Hiroshima maidens sat down for a radio interview. Hiroko Tasaka, the woman who'd had 13 operations, said she was looking forward to going home and restarting her life. Did you um, learn any new things here in this country that you will take back with you? Uh, machine embroidery. Embroider me. Oh, machine embroidery. And will yes. you be able to use that when you go back to Japan? I imagine you will, won't you? I hope so. Yes. And then, uh, Miss Yoshi Enokawa. Um, I am uh, Yoshi Enokawa. Thank you very much. Everything. I have a nice time and a nice operation. Now, what are your own particular thoughts as you go home now um, to Japan? Of course, I'm looking forward to seeing my mother again. But then, too, my thoughts are uh, very complicated at this moment because I am sorry to leave the many friends. Home to Hiroshima, after a year of treatment in America, the maidens are full of gratitude for the warmth and love shown by Americans. Preceded by the ashes of one girl who died of a heart attack in the United States, the maidens of Hiroshima have, like their city, rebuilt the future as they return to waiting, waving loved ones. The women's family members were overjoyed to have them back. The father of one of the girls, as I recall, he said, as I saw my daughter, I noticed a tremendous change in her. Uh, she, she walked with her head up, uh, her footsteps were light, and there was a brightness in her whole, whole countenance. It was only secondary that I noticed the tremendous change that the operation had done for her on her face. It wasn't just their families that were excited to have them home. Thanks to their adventure in the United States, the women were now celebrities in Japan. They were swarmed with media requests and demands to speak about their surgeries and what they saw in America. All of this publicity ended up benefiting everyone who'd been injured by the atomic bomb. The attention given to the Hiroshima Maidens Project put pressure on the Japanese government to give free lifetime medical care to all survivors now, victims of the bombing wouldn't have to get on a plane to find the treatment they needed. At Hiroshima's Red Cross Hospital, there is a special wing where survivors receive free medical treatment. Since its opening in 1956, there have been 150,000 outpatients. Reverend Tanimoto wanted to keep the momentum going, to keep the group together, and to continue pushing to end nuclear war. Tanimoto felt that they had an obligation to be spokesmen for the peace, to be spokesmen for the causes that he was supporting, too. 
The women appreciated the opportunities that Reverend Tanimoto had given them, but his cause wasn't necessarily theirs. They wanted to get on with their lives, to live a quiet existence, not to stand out in any way, certainly not as a spokesman for peace. And so many of the women chose to recede from public view. In the years that followed, their successes and tragedies would unfold largely out of sight. Many of the women still carried scars, and their transplanted skin was sometimes a burden. It would tear easily and get infected. But they were able to move their hands and limbs more freely, which allowed them to pursue fulfilling careers. One woman became a corporate executive, another taught sewing to impoverished women, and one opened her own business. On the outskirts of Hiroshima is the home and beauty shop of Mrs. Suzui Oshima. Suzue Oshima was one of the women who'd shared a home with Rodney Barker in 1955. She named her shop after the Barker's hometown of Darien, Connecticut. Soon afterward, she was married and now has two healthy children. Twelve of the women would get married. One would die of stomach cancer, a disease likely caused by exposure to the atomic blast. But despite fears, none of their children would show negative effects from radiation. Not all of the Hiroshima maidens would stay in Japan. Shigeko Niyamoto returned to America after only six months. Inspired in part by the care she received at Mount Sinai, she decided to study nursing. Right now I'm working as a baby nurse, take care of a newborn baby. And every time I see these babies, so beautiful. We got to have a beautiful world for them. Seeing those babies inspired Shigeko to speak out about what she'd lived through, to become the kind of activist that Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto had always hoped she would be. As of 2023, she's in her 90s and living in California. Now I feel I have a mission to talk to the people who ever want to know my experience, how the war was. I'd be glad to do so. For the rest of his life, Reverend Tanimoto was a fierce advocate for nuclear disarmament. If the next war starts, that means no survivor, no victory, all kill. He told his daughter Coco that as a survivor, she also had an obligation to speak out. He said, Coco, you're the only child, only baby who survive in our neighborhood. That's why we want you to work for the world peace. Coco is 78 years old now, and she's been a peace activist for almost four decades. She still thinks about the Hiroshima maidens, how they were so kind to her when she was a little girl, and how they suffered because of an act of war. And she believes the best way to honor them is to keep telling their story, so no one else forgets it either. I am trying to talk to the young generation, but uh, it's so sad we still have a war within this world. Oh, I don't know, but I have to do something. We don't want the same mistake again. That was the season finale of One Year 1955. Thanks so much for listening to, I hope, all six of our episodes. And if you want even more One Year, we've got seasons on 1977, 1995, 1986, and 1942 in our back catalog. So have at them. But wait, there's going to be more. We've got yet another season coming later this year. And this one is about 1990. If you've got ideas for us, or if you want to give us feedback on what you've just heard, send us an email at oneyearatslate.com or give us a call on the One Year Hotline at 203-343-0777. We'd love to hear from you, and you'll be hearing from us before you know it. If you want to hear more of One Year 1955, subscribe to Slate Plus. Very soon, Slate Plus subscribers will get a member-exclusive episode with a whole new story and interview. 
In addition, as a member, you'll also hear every Slate podcast without ads and never hit the paywall on Slate's site. If you'd like to sign up for Slate Plus, go to slate.com slash one year plus. Again, that's slate.com slash one year plus. This episode was written by me, Josh Levine, One Year's editorial director. Our senior producer is Evan Chung. One Year is produced by Kelly Jones and Evan Chung, with additional production by Sophie Summergrad. This episode was edited by Joel Meyer and Derek John, Slate's executive producer of Narrative Podcasts. Our senior technical director is Merritt Jacob. Holly Allen created the artwork for this season. Rodney Barker's book is The Hiroshima Maidens, a story of courage, compassion, and survival. Alan Pietrobon's book, Norman Cousins, Peacemaker in the Atomic Age, was another valuable resource for this episode. Some of the audio you heard comes from Pacifica Radio Archives and the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington College. Thank you to Masami Nishimoto, Mary Winstrom, Tanya Mouse, Sean Ellis, and to Molly Seegers and the archives at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And special thanks to everyone who made this season of One Year possible. Susan Matthews, Joel Anderson, Christina Cotarucci, Madeline Ducharme, Forrest Wickman, Katie Shepard, Hilary Fry, Katie Rayford, Ben Richmond, Caitlin Schneider, Cleo Levin, Kevin Bendis, Seth Brown, Rachel Strom, Jessica Seidman, Karen Fjellman, Paul Summergrad, Randy Glassman, Andrew Robinson, Emily John, and Alicia Montgomery, Slate's VP of Audio. Thanks for listening. And look out for our first episode on 1990, coming soon.